Good day, and welcome to the UNSW Canberra as Cyber Hypothetical. Uh, I'm Paul Madison, uh, Director of the UNSW Defence Research Institute, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you here for this second annual uh, Cyber Hypothetical, the first to, to be held virtually for obvious reasons. And the uh, title for our discussion uh, today um, is The Eternal Selfie, uh, the role of facial recognition in national security. Um, I'd like to welcome all who have uh, chosen to join us for the next hour uh, from all across Australia, uh, representing academia, um, uh, industry, um, and government uh, departments and agencies, uh, welcome. And a special welcome to those from um, overseas, especially our, uh, our allies in the United States, Canada, uh, UK, New Zealand, and others. It's, it's great that you've chosen to, uh, to be with us here today to talk about uh, a really interesting and fascinating uh, subject uh, in facial recognition and national security. Um, quick word about UNSW Canberra Cyber. It's a center of excellence in conducting impactful multidisciplinary research and educating the next generation of Australian leaders and scholars in this important and growing field. Um, we all know that facial recognition has become ubiquitous in many environments and whilst offering many benefits uh, for society, including improved uh, public security, it is also causing problems, um, challenges in this age of social media and mobile smart devices. So today we're gonna consider this from a range of angles, uh, including um, the public sector, government, public policy, um, civil society, you know, how it's affecting you and I, our families, the choices we make, uh, the choices others make that impact upon us, and the private sector. What what are uh, innovators doing in the um, in industry uh, that are impacting upon this particular um, technology? Um, we've got a great panel joining us here today. Um, three uh, distinguished um, experts in the field, um, and I'll quickly introduce um, our three panelists, and then we will move on into the discussion. Uh, joining us from uh, the University of Melbourne is uh, Dr. Suolette uh, Dreyfus. Uh, Suolette is a lecturer in the School of Computing and Information Systems there at uh, Uni Melbourne, and her main research areas are in cybersecurity, uh, hacking, digital privacy, and anonymity. So welcome, Suolette. Um, Dr. Anthea McCarthy-Jones uh, is uh, here at UNSW Canberra um, with me. Uh, Anthea is a senior lecturer in the School of Business here at UNSW Canberra, and her current uh, research focuses on the roles of brokers in the organizational and operational structures of illicit networks and transnational criminal organizations, and the threats that these non-traditional actors uh, pose to the state. And uh, finally, but not least, uh, Mr. Rand Waltzman, um, joining us from California. The Rand, uh, he's with the Rand Corporation, where he's currently serving as the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of, of RAND. Um, RAND, his name, is, uh, is a specialist on artificial intelligence and the weaponization of information. Uh, he's worked uh, extensively in the field for, for many years, including at DARPA, where he managed a major research uh, around massive scale data analytics and AI in the areas of insider threat detection, social media and computer vision. So uh, welcome all three of our panelists. Uh, we're gonna um, have a conversation here this morning, which we're gonna structure basically around three themes. And I've mentioned that already, government, um, the private sector, civil society. And I've, we're gonna start with, um, with, with government. And um, I'm going to uh, throw a question over to, to Anthea. So, so when, we, when we look at government public policy, we're, we're looking at how facial recognition technologies are affecting law enforcement and security agencies and in how they go about their business, uh, how they deal with transnational criminal threats, uh, domestic threats, uh, how they, um, how, how methods and practices are, are perhaps changing. And so I'm just going to throw this over to you, Anthea, in, in a world where anyone can potentially identify anyone else. How does this impact the work of government and law enforcement agencies? Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question, and I think there's a couple of things here, and I'll probably make um, two main points in relation to this. And I'm going to speak about this 
uh, mostly in relation to the sort of field that I sort of uh, conduct research on, which is, as you kindly uh, said in your introduction, criminal networks, but also looking at the sort of disruptive um, or disruption capabilities of also law enforcement. And in relation to the sort of challenges and opportunities, and I think there are both that are sort of present when we look at issues such as the role of facial recognition software and how this will sort of interact with um, the work of government and law enforcement agencies. I see a particular challenge relating to um, the way in which agencies who rely on individuals that require a certain amount of anonymity to conduct their work. And some of the key concerns around these types of issues relate to the fact that facial recognition software is sort of considered to increase the likelihood of um, things such as the mosaic effect. And the mosaic effect basically refers to when you have disparate items of information that when combined with other items of information actually gain an added sort of uh, significance or meaning. And so I think one of the key concerns here or the risk is that the exposure, and it really doesn't matter whether it's uh, intentional or unintentional, of any feature or aspect of say an individual who is needing to conduct their work with anonymity if parts of this is combined with information that say might already be held by say criminal organizations, this will complete the mosaic and essentially the mosaic effect and the anonymity will be lost. And I think when we're looking at these concerns, we need to start thinking about, you know, moving forward and projecting into the future. How can these types of um, government and law enforcement agencies develop challenge proof identities in a digital age? And I think also sort of taking it forward is, can we actually develop identities, working identities that can also be resistant to things such as the mosaic effect? And I think these are particularly difficult issues that we need to grapple with, especially in this sort of context of the rapidly expanding fields of biometrics and facial recognition technology. But I also think that we have crossed the Rubicon, there's no going back, and so we need to really address these issues head on. So I think this means that we need to start looking at ways or new ways that we can protect or at least obfuscate the identity of, you know, officers that are increasingly going to have quite a large digital footprint and a lot of them if we're looking at sort of recruitment into the future they're going to have this footprint from birth. And what's interesting is I think you can see that um, a lot of children these days seem to be born Instagram ready. And I think an interesting part of this is it's not just an individual who's also creating their footprint at su such an early age. It's also looking at multiple sources that contribute to these sort of digital footprints, just even as basic as parents or grandparents. And so this obviously creates quite a lot of complexity. I think one option that we need to look at is how maybe an individual's existing digital footprint could actually be synthesized with other curated information to form a challenge proof identity that is actually more fit for purpose in a digital age. And I think that's sort of an avenue that's worth exploring, looking at these types of approaches that utilize layering effects. I think also an important point to be uh, made here is that when sort of government or law enforcement agencies are looking to do this, I don't think that they can actually rely on multinational companies such as you know, Google and uh, Facebook, which, you know, to be honest, are the holders of so much of an individual's digital footprint. I don't think we can rely on them to be particularly cooperative. And I think it was just yesterday that the Director General of ASIO actually remarked himself on the uncooperative nature of companies um, in relation to ASIO's attempts recently to put down espionage threats. So I think that sort of problematic interplay between the government and business relationship on this particular issue is going to be something that requires further thought and attention. I think because, because of these problems, we need to probably start rethinking the unit of analysis and how we sort of approach the nature of undercover work or any work that requires a certain level of anonymity. And perhaps this is about shifting our focus from potentially seeing these things as being undertaken by hiding in the shadows to maybe looking at the approach of maybe how we can hide better in plain sight. And I think, you know, the rationale behind this seemingly controversial approach is that if, say, an officer uses his or her pre-existing digital footprint in at least some form, 
it does eliminate the need to create complex legends and they can be quite sort of time consuming and costly to create. I think the other interesting thing here is if you start integrating the truth or elements of the truth into a narrative, it does tend to be very um, challenge proof. But I think this also needs to be balanced with the risk, of course, is the loss of protection that an assumed identity provides and not just for the officer, but also for their family and I think this is a very persuasive reason um, as to why some of these types of issues maybe haven't been explored in the depth that I think they could have been. However, I think sort of going back to some of my previous points, we need to seriously consider that assumed identities won't or no longer offer the same protection that they once did, given this sort of role and the accessibility to uh, facial recognition software. And this was a really interesting sort of issue that came to the fore about five years ago in Mexico, when um, Mexican authorities quite unexpectedly actually uncovered a very complex and intricate counterintelligence system that had been placed across the state of um, Tamaulipas. And it turned out that it was actually the Gulf Cartel, one of the largest drug trafficking organisations that had actually um, established this counterintelligence system. And what they'd done with all these cameras um, that were set up in key locations across this um, part of Mexico is that they were gathering intelligence on all the identities of local, state and federal law enforcement officers. And to make matters worse, if you could, um, it turned out that this particular system had been in place for quite some time. And so it presented this really drastic and quite severe problem for law enforcement was that most of the identi identities, sorry, of these officers were well known to the sort of cartel. And what's really interesting, the rate of change when we're looking at this type of technology is that we can see this high level of organisation and sophistication with these types of organised crime groups to sort of be early adopters of technology um, in attempts to sort of basically um, counter a lot of the efforts of law enforcement. And I would say that, you know, if we're looking at this example five years ago, these cameras didn't have facial recognition technology, but I'd say if they're doing this today, it probably most certainly does. Um, I want to just slightly change um, tack and maybe talk about some of the opportunities that I actually see that facial recognition software can provide. And I think we've already seen a lot of this if we look at... Um, the work of Interpol and EU, they've had a lot of success by using facial recognition um, software to identify criminals in pedophile rings, sex trafficking rings, as well as members of terrorist groups. And so I think, you know, it's important to sort of look at these issues in further detail. Um, what I'm particularly interested in is how this relates to transnational organised crime groups. And what we see and have seen over a period of time now is these types of groups are now opting to sort of operate as interconnected illicit networks that basically traverse, their activities traverse great geographical distances. And in order to undertake their activities across this sort of um, expansive sort of geographical boundaries, it requires a high level of sophistication and cooperation rather than competition to achieve end goals. And part of the reason and how they're able to do this in a network sense is the way in which they draw on the capabilities of brokers to basically connect disparate criminal networks located in discrete geographical locations. And a really good example of this is looking at uh, the way in which the symbiotic relationships between Mexican organised crime groups and Chinese organised crime groups in the sort of um, production and distribution of methamphetamine has um, developed. And this has been through a very complicated and sophisticated system of brokerage. I think what's also important here is understanding that it's brokers who tend to be the most elusive, but often the most important parts of illicit networks, especially in relation to network resilience and looking at the way in which these networks are able to sort of resist pressure from law enforcement. And I think what's also interesting is there's been a previous preference to target the leadership of organised crime groups for various reasons. And sometimes this is sort of, um, you know, known as a kingpin strategy. And I think, you know, there's merit to this um, approach, but I think when this is sort of preference too much, what it means is that other critical elements of um, the network tend to be sort of ignored or they remain in the shadows or are only understood to be of sort of secondary importance. And I think what's important to look at here is what we're seeing um, is that time and time again, a network strength and capacity for renewal and resilience 
can often relate to sort of the brokers who act as critical junctures across um, the network. And it's not necessarily the leadership that needs to be the sort of focus. And I think a really good example of this is, you know, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the Sinaloa cartel. It's probably the most well known of the Mexican cartels and its former leader, El Chapo. Well, El Chapo has been removed from the network. He's in jail in the United States. And the Sinaloa cartel continues to make billions of dollars every year. So again, sort of looking at how they do this, it's not necessarily the leadership, but it's the role of brokers or these actors in the network that provide this um, necessary scaffolding. So this is where I actually think that facial recognition can actually help with identifying and shining a light on these more shadowy figures in networks. Um, that may be less visible, but that doesn't mean they're not incredibly important in the network's activities. And I think that this is where I see sort of potential for government and law enforcement uh, to capitalise on the opportunities provided by facial recognition software. And um, I noted just um, a couple of months ago in the Mexican city of Juarez, they've actually invested in um, a whole range of cameras throughout the city that actually have facial recognition software in them to actually assist with um, not just identifying members of a sort of cartel, but actually trying to go out and identify who are these actors who provide this sort of necessary scaffolding. And I think there's a lot of potential here. I think this also needs to be sort of, um, I'll just make a, a couple of points finally before I end my section. I think this, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities here and, and it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. But I think also this is still going to require a fair amount of human resources um, to be increased, to validate a lot of the data that I think is going to be collected, especially due to the way that even basic things such as aging, cosmetics, plastic surgery, and even lifestyle choices like smoking can actually significantly impact the data points on a person's face. So I still feel that facial recognition um, software is gonna be a great asset, but you also need that sort of human factor. Finally, people might be thinking, well, why have I talked primarily about examples from Mexico? It seems quite far away from the Australian context. But when we start looking at things, 2019 was a record year for Australia and also New Zealand in the amount of um, shipments of methamphetamine that can be traced back to Mexico. And so I think what we need to realise is things that have been now trialled and implemented in countries like Mexico are going to have a fundamental impact on our um, national security in a broad sense. And I think facial uh, recognition technology and software has a really interesting role to play, but um, I think I'll leave it there. So thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Anthea. That was an excellent sort of overview and, and I'm really fascinated by your, um, you know, digging into the, the, the cartel, uh, the transnational criminal network uh, culture and, and, and teasing out the sort of the positive um, the opportunities here in, in terms of applying the facial recognition technology to to um, help law enforcement folks get the job done. Um, I, I think you mentioned um, how dire is the um, methamphetamine uh, uh, situation here in Australia. I mean, the per capita usage is um, is astronomical relative to other uh, countries, and um, we we know that a, a lot of those meth vectors. Um, are, are out of North America. Um, they're coming out of Canada, um, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Chinese gangs uh, there, um, and and so this is a this is a shared problem that 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 we know that, that our law enforcement folks are working hard to to sort out. Um, I've just got a question, one question for you, Anthea, yeah, it, and it's the, the earlier part of your of your um, presentation. Um, just, I, I'm around officers going undercover. So I had a I had a colleague who was a long-serving um, uh, agency officer who, who proudly told me that he knew what he was going to do when he was in high school, so he he, he never had his picture taken, so he wasn't in the year, he wasn't in the yearbook. I thought, well, that's pretty neat. But 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 today, as they're rec recruiting young men and women to to come into uh, security agencies, they all have these footprints you're talking about. Is is the is the idea the notion of actually going undercover? Um, be being overtaken by technology and that it will just become too risky. Uh, you, going undercover just won't be a feasible thing to do. Well, yeah, I mean, and I think this is part of the problem, isn't it? That it's um, the way in which we understand these types of things and how they're sort of um, undertaking is changing as a result of the technology. And I think 
it's an interesting point. I think your friend might be smarter than most of you already knew what he wanted to do at such a young age. But I think most people don't. And so, you know, this is a thing. You're collecting this digital footprint and you don't realise how it's going to impact you later. But, I, you know, and I think that's the thing is maybe, you know, we need to go round the mountain in this sort of sense and look at the ways in which instead of looking at the threats and the risks that this footprint basically um, presents, actually look at how it can be used as part of a toolkit to actually enhance. And maybe, maybe, as you say, approach these types of things in a different way. And again, maybe that's sort of, I was hinting at that, saying that that's part of that whole concept of hiding in plain sight or being able to actually synthesize and curate um, information that might help a certain sort of operation that's combined with sort of truth with that, which then creates that sort of challenge proof um, element to their identity. And it's a bit more to me fit the purpose in that sense. Great. Thanks, Anthea. Thank um, before we move on to the next uh, topic, uh, I just want to remind our participants that um, uh, you can submit your questions um, on uh, as we go along here and we'll find time at the end, I hope, to uh, to take some of your your questions. So let's let's move on to um, a look at civil society writ large. So you know, the average uh, the, the average Joe out on the streets, uh, consumers of, of social media, um, dealing with doxing, dealing with deep fakes, dealing with disinformation, trying to understand and make sense of the reality around them. Um, and a question for you, uh, Rand, um, is, is in, in, in what ways does facial recognition in particular and computer vision more generally impact our daily lives? And, and what are some of the hidden dangers that you uh, think we, we, we need to be aware of? Well, so actually I'd like to start out by adding something to what Anthea said. It was just, it's a couple of points, but it's all relevant, right? So the first thing is, um, you know, criminal organizations, for example, one of the big advantages they have, as well as other organizations that interact with civil society, is that they don't have any human subject protection restrictions. They don't have any privacy restrictions. Nobody's, nobody's telling them what they can and can't do. So they're, they're not sitting there with their hands tied behind their backs like government agencies are. So that, that gives them a big leg up, right? So that's really a great advantage they have. The other interesting point is that these systems, they're, they're buggy. And they actually, the introduction of these kinds of systems enormously expands the attack surface. You know. People, when you talk about cyber hacking, you have to break into a computer. But these kinds of systems, any kind of statistical machine learning based system, you don't have to break into it to attack it. These systems can be deceived from the outside. So, you know, it's like if you want to deceive a person, you don't have to drill a hole in their head and do something, you know, insert something in their brain. It's all from their, you know, from their sensory perception. That's how you get at them. And these systems have the similar, have a very similar feature. So they can be fooled, they can be deceived in many, many different ways. Um, so that's another really important point, right? Uh, you can convince one of these systems that you're somebody else just by putting a, a few marks on your face or a simple, you don't even have to make a complicated disguise. I mean, it can be fooled in many, many, many ways. So the systems are buggy and they're also subject. I mean, it, you know, I wouldn't even say that's a bug. This is a design, this is how they're built. So, and this is an area, by the way, which has been received very, actually very little attention, how these systems can be deceived. There are a few people who are looking at it, but not enough, not really very many. And people are barreling ahead with these things and uh, without really thinking about what, how, how they can be tripped up. So that's just the general, those are just two general observations that apply to no matter what point of view you're looking at the problem, right? So from a personal perspective, there are lots and lots of uh, potential pitfalls in this whole business, right? So for example, um, so, you know, I should preface my remarks and say, you know, I'm a guy who lives really sort of on the dark side of the world. So, I mean, I'm looking at things always from the very, you know, the most evil perspective you can imagine. That's, that's where I live. Um, so I'm not one of those guys with a shiny optimism. Oh, you know, you'll be able to do this. You'll be able to do that. Yeah, I know. That's, I can leave that to other people. There's not so many people looking at it from my perspective. So I, I'll stick with that. So I'm going to talk from that point of view, right? So one of the interesting things, you know, in addition to facial recognition, there's also facial reading. So for example, I want to be able to read people's emotions. Okay, that's in a really actually a, a useful thing to do. At DARPA, when I ran this program, I ran the computer vision program at DARPA I, from, the, from the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s. One day, a Japanese guy came to my office. A Japanese guy says, 
you know, he's, he works for a big corporation in Japan. And he asked me, he says, do you have any technology that can read emotions in people's faces, how they're reacting? So I said, oh, right, well, so, so what's your interest? Why are you looking at that? He says, oh, there's fortunes of money that hinge on that capability. I said, really? So, so what he explained to me is that in negotiations, in negotiations, you know, Western has come to Japan and they have the Westerners sitting, you know, these big corporations, big business deals, right? So they have all the Westerners sitting on one side of the table and all the Japanese sitting on the other side of the table. And what he, <laughs> the statement that he made to me, he says, you know, he says, our problem is that Western faces are impossible to read. It's impossible to see any emotion in Western faces at all. This is what the guy told me. So, okay. And I said, okay, so what do you do about it now? He says, well, you know, we have, we have, we have people watching secretly, the other guys. So when we say something, they can read their reactions and they, they either send it to us through an earpiece or they have a little, little ticker tape under the table that we're looking at, different tricks. He says, but this isn't scalable. So he says, I really need something that can read their emotions, right? So I thought that was a really kind of an interesting <laughs> application. Um, and there has been work done, fair amount of work done actually reading emotions in people's faces. But so you think about, you know, how does that affect you as a private person? I mean, in negotiations, that's one thing, but it can affect you in many, many different ways. So for example, when you're interacting, you go to a store or you're interacting with the authorities or you're interacting with anything, people can, you know, if they're reading your emotions, the way you're reacting in the wrong way, well, that could prompt um, a reaction that uh, you may not like. So this is something to be aware of and to see, you know, are people really using this kind of tricks? Um, the other thing then, of course, is uh, activity recognition. So going beyond, so now we're going from facial recognition to reading emotions and faces to actually activity recognition. So now you have, you know, cameras watching you and trying to identify what it is you're doing. You know, what are you trying to do? What, 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 are, you, what are you involved in? And that may provoke certain kind of reactions and you could be, <laughs> You know, the system could mistake you for doing one thing when you're actually doing something else and it could cause a reaction uh, that you're not really, not really very helpful to. So that's, that's another potential set of problems. And again, these systems can be deceived and somebody who's taking some action can fool the system to be one way when it's that something else is really happening. Um, other kinds of things that can go wrong. So for example, uh, since everybody's taking your picture, and your activity, so it's not only a picture, but your movements and everything, and your voice, the voice is important. Uh, people can make uh, forgeries of you and basically put you anywhere saying anything that they like, doing anything and saying anything that they want. Well, you know, that some people may think that's fun and in some cases it may be entertaining, but the other cases, a little bit less entertaining. So these are, all, these, these are all kind of really hidden gotchas in the technology. And again, when you add on the fact that the technology isn't perfect, it has lots of uh, issues with it. Um, you know, what that tells you is that you, you need to learn to become defensive. You need to be defensive. Somehow you need to understand what's being done to you. I mean, just out in the wild, out in the open. And what could you possibly do to protect yourself against it? So these are... Yeah, these are problems that are going to be growing because as people think these kinds of technologies are more and more helpful, um, well, the more helpful they look like they're becoming, the more holes they introduce into the, so the, the more help that they provide, the more holes that get introduced into the system. And the more things that can be exploited, the things that are to your disadvantage. So, 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 so Rand, um, you started out by saying you're a worst case scenario kind of guy. Um, yeah. and, and so, listening to you uh, opens up all sorts of, you know, alternative futures. And, and so, so where, where, where do you think this is leading? I mean, what, um, what does this mean for an individual who may just simply may not be aware of, of, of how exposed they are? And, and what does it mean in a grander scale in, in terms of um, social trust, social cohesion, public confidence? Um, you know, how, how bad do you think this could get? Well, it could actually get really bad. And it's, and it's a little bit like, you know, the old story with a frog in the water, right? You put a frog in the water, you slowly turn up the temperature before it figured out what was happening, it's dead. You know, as opposed to you just throw it in the hot water and it jumps out. So I don't know if frogs really work like that, but that's a story. And I, so, but we're kind of in the same situation. I mean, people, you know, they're slowly turning up the temperature with this and more and more of this technology is being introduced. 
and uh, people are largely unaware and they're going to remain unaware until it's too late. And then, then you're at the mercy of all kinds of things, so the kinds of things I was describing. And it could, you know, it could lead to a lot of problems. So having I, listened, and a serious have, problem. Having listened to Anthea um, uh, talk about the law enforcement piece, do you, do, do you see any, foresee any sort of concrete examples of how this will generate, um, you know, greater criminal activity pressures in society? Well, I don't know how many pressures. I don't know what you mean by criminal pressure. Well, it, it, um, it, it increased, uh, you know, it, it innovative approaches from criminal uh, criminal organizations to exploit, um, you know, weaknesses Absolutely. that are exposed here. Absolutely. The more weaknesses you introduce, the more people are ready to line up to, to exploit them. You know, it's like the old saying, a sucker is born every minute and tend to take them. Right. <laughs> it's right. exactly the same thing with this, right? Yeah. Every kind of hole that's introduced by technology, every as the attack surface expands, the people ready to exploit it are lining up. So, and the other thing is, like I said, those who are waiting to exploit these things, they don't have the same kind of restrictions as people in government have. They don't have to worry about any of these things. They don't have to. They don't have to go to institutional review boards. They don't have to go to about human subject protection people. They don't have to care about any of that stuff. So they have completely free hands, and that puts the rest of us at a huge disadvantage. So, so Tom, uh, sorry, uh, Randa, a, a question has just come in from, from Tom, and thank you, Tom, for this. Um, and it's a, his question is, what what can the everyday individual? So, what can what can I do, uh, to protect myself? Well, the first thing is to become aware of of these technologies that are being introduced and how they're being used. You, you can't protect yourself unless you know what's you know what's out there. And unfortunately, that's a total moving target, right? Because it's evolving really fast and it's, change, it's constantly changing. So, you know, if you really want to protect yourself, the first thing you need to do is be ready to put a significant amount of time into, into being aware of what's going on. And then you need to look at, you know, well, what kinds of protections are people offering? Because for, for every guy that comes along to exploit something, there's going to be somebody else to come along and say, okay, well, here's how to counter that. I mean, it's, <laughs> right? Attack and counter attack. I mean, it's, it's, that's the game. And you have to be, I guess, what I'm saying is you need to be ready to jump into that fray. If you're not, then you're totally at the mercy of whatever's going on. But that takes effort. It takes real effort. And the, the problem is most people don't have the time or the, you know, or the will to actually put the kind of effort that's really required to protect yourself. Hmm. And the, the specific things you can do, it depends on whatever technology is being offered. So that's changing all the time. So, there's, so the only general statement you can really make is, you have to be continually on top of it. That's great, Rand. Thanks. Um, so, so we're going to uh, move on then now to the, uh, the, the the third sort of thematic here, um, which is around civil society. Um, um, sorry, or around the, the private sector. And, and I guess the context here is um, companies that are developing uh, new technologies, uh, you know, facial recognition, um, of uh, uh, applications, um, and, but we have millions and billions of consumers who are going online, uh, shopping, being asked to, um, uh, to, to identify themselves, I guess, through, through facial recognition. And I'd just like to ask um, Suelette um, for your views. Um, are, are, are there risks uh, involved with the use of facial recognition software for individuals who are, who are interacting online with private companies? Yeah, there are really big risks. So um, Rand is a guy who lives on the dark side of the world. I'm a gal who lives on the bright side of the world. Uh, and, and, and that should give us some interesting uh, discussion. So um, I think about some of the major risks, uh, which apply to both state and private sector because software is being used. Companies that provide software um, uh, like Clearview AI have been selling to both. And some of those risks uh, include the repurposing of data. So it's used for a, an intent that was not, you know, for a reason that was not the original intent. The inability to change data. We can't change our face the way we change our PIN number with our ATM card. And the uniqueness of facial data, because unlike fingerprints, it lets us read a person's emotional reaction. In that sense, it's a window into the soul 
um, if the eyes are the window um, to the soul. So um, I, I don't, I guess I have a slightly different mindset from Rand. I don't think that civil society should need to be defensive or think defensive. Um, I think it's our regulator's job and our government's job to make sure that we don't have to live our lives that way in a free and open society. Um, one way you could do that, I know there was a question about well, what would you do um, in, in a regulatory sense to protect um, individual citizens. And really what this is doing, this facial recognition software and digital images of people's faces and the ability to read emotions is fundamentally shifting the balance of power between the individual and the state and the individual and companies. Uh, and, and I would actually say, well, yes, there's a very small component that are criminal, but most citizens are innocent. And shifting the power for the 99% of the population that's innocent is, is, is very concerning. So what kinds of things could we do to deal with that? The kinds of things might be um, to allow people, legislation that might allow people effectively to put your face on a do not call list. So we have the opportunity, if you want your phone number on a do not call list, you can request anyone who, who spams you, ring me on your telephone, put me on a do not call list, do not call me again, you are instructed. You can put yourself on a central do not call list. For the state, the use of facial recordings and recognition should require a judge's signature, get a warrant. Um, and in that sense, it's no different from wiretapping a telephone conversation. People can't, however, protect themselves when they're walking down the street or they're walking in a shopping mall doing shopping from the privacy risk. And as we saw from trialing of facial recognition software in London, um, you had police vans who would pull up to uh, the side of a footpath against a brick wall and film every single person walking down that footpath. And indeed there was an incident, a case that was reported of someone who chose, it was a winter's day, to put the scarf over the bottom half of their face. Um, and in doing so, uh, the police pulled them aside and insisted they take it off. They said, I've done nothing wrong. Why do I need to do that? And uh, they were issued with a fine. Uh, and so it's a fine of the state wants to be able to read your face. Now, the, um, the reading of emotions, if you will, the reading of the soul uh, is, is as much in the private sector as potentially in the state sector. And we know that because some research actually I've done with a fellow researcher, in fact, at UNSW EDFA, uh, has looked at the impact uh, on consumer privacy of shopping. And particularly, um, for example, we had uh, one of our team go out and look at some of the major shopping malls in Australia. If you've seen those large um, glassy billboards as tall as you and you know eight feet long or whatever, six feet long, that uh, flash up ads, digital ads periodically. At the very top of those, you may have noticed that there's a camera. Um, and, and that camera is not just um, taking snaps of someone as they walk by, potentially without their permission or with forced consent because you can't opt out even if you know that it's going on. That camera is potentially also uh, doing what's called sentiment analysis. So what the private sector advertises as the bank, or as the product, is reading, identifying 18 demographic uh, profiles from uh, the camera reading. Um, that it, it can highlight facial features and it quotes nose viewing habits. In fact, it knows your moods. Um, and in fact, it uses these moods to trigger convent, con, uh, content when um, it determines that the relevant target audience is, is watching. So in this sense, it's being used in a marketing sense to say, oh, it's your quote, campaign intelligence for your advertising campaign. You can imagine though, that this campaign can easily slip from persuasion to manipulation. Uh, and that's, that's, quite, that's quite concerning. You maybe can choose not to walk by these boards if you knew that the cameras were there, um, but is it realistic to never get on an international flight? Because that's another place where cameras are sitting in front of you uh, on the screen at the top of the camera. So that was identified in the last couple of years by a researcher actually out of Singapore. Um, and in fact, it was revealed that American Airlines and Singapore and Emirates and Qantas all had installed these screens that all had little cameras at the top. And initially the airline said, oh, it's never been activated, quote, 
possible future use. But the fact is, it remains there. And on a flight out of Australia, most flights are eight hours to anywhere. You're going to have eight hours of a camera trained on you. That's very concerning. Now, the Europeans have a principle, uh, a privacy principle, which is around the right to be forgotten. And this completely undermines that right to be forgotten. We have a set of civil rights that are embedded in Western style democracies, and they're there to protect people's privacy. They're there for a reason. You could say, well, don't choose to shop at this site. Don't choose to go to these places. Don't choose to go, for example, to 7-Eleven, which also has cameras on top of screens, flashing advertisements on top of petrol pumps now. As you pump your car, you're having your face red, right? Um, but uh, but that's, not, that's not always possible to do. Uh, and, and I would actually suggest that protecting those individual rights, including the right to have the privacy of your own face to determine how it's used, to exit from the use of it, uh, is something that is fundamental to our free and open society, the structure of our free and open society. You can't sell your kidney on eBay. Even if there's a market for it, even if a company thinks they'll you know, buy it for you, we don't allow that because we know that there are certain protections that must be in a bubble around the individual citizen in our society. Uh, and, and this seems to be one of those emerging protections that needs to be set out in regulation. So there have been pullbacks from that. So Clearview AI, which matches faces to a database of more than 3 billion images they've indexed from the internet, including, including social media applications, uh, was initially um, selling that technology to Bank of America and Macy's and Walmart. Uh, and they announced in May that they were now only going to sell it to law enforcement and governments. Uh, and in some states, they're not selling at all because of the pushback, because people were so upset about it. There's a legal case taken in the US uh, because of the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, which is quite a far reaching um, a piece of facial recognition related legislation that makes it illegal for companies to collect and store sensitive biometric data without consent. So there's starting to be some pushback uh, on this in legislation. There was new privacy legislation that was uh, passed and came into force in, in California in the past year, um, but we're not there yet. Um, the way that I think about the transition that is going on is that old surveillance, be it state surveillance or company-based surveillance, was really about what you say. So it's your conversation, whether it's a wiretap or postal or chat logs. New surveillance is who you are. So it's movement tracking of consumers in public, private places, some facial recognition, some mood analysis, um, but, but really, um, we're now in the vein with sentiment analysis of who we say you are. And the danger with this, as Rand touched on, is that this can be misinterpreted. It's an imperfect science, and it's often based on untested, non-transparent science, and it can potentially be used in a very discriminatory manner. So those are sort of my areas of big concern in this, and I see there needs to be action on it, and action sooner rather than later, because right now the technology is traveling at warp speed, and regulation of it, control of it, transparency about what it's doing is like a tortoise on sand. That's where I'm at. Any questions about that? Anthea's going, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 that was great, Sue Ouellette. And, and actually, I had a question for you, but you just touched on it right in, in your sort of closing remark there. Uh, the, the leg in, in terms of regulatory capacity to, to address um, the, the rapidity at, at which technology is moving. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any ideas around how to close that gap? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the fundamental problems, uh, if I can say this, about the different elements of the security state that wants to keep countries like Australia and the US safe is that in building secrecy and walls, um, it has perhaps um, separated itself from some of its best allies and that is civil society. So civil society can keep a Western democracy honest. And if you actually wanna stop election interference and all of these other things, civil society is, is a really great uh, defense for that. 
they also have their ear to the ground because in a sense they are thinking defensively, but a different type of defensively than, than Rand was talking about. So the, the perception and the ear to the ground and the grassroots knowledge that they have and the care they have for keeping our democratic and open society um, of the same timber that it was always meant to be, uh, I think it's really important to incorporate and draw closer links between them and decision makers in places like Canberra and DC, so that people are both aware of what is that unforeseen impact that's happening from the technology and how do we defend the, you know, the innocent citizen from, from having their rights encroached on by it. Excellent, thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, so you opened by um, sort of contrasting your um, sort of gla glass half full view with with Rand's, and 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 you noted that Anthea was re responding uh, with, with some sort of facial emotion on on uh, on screen here. So perhaps Anthea or Rand, do you want to jump in at this point and 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 uh, and sort of comment on anything Suwaleta has had to say? Well, well, I said to something about regulation. You know, the government is never going to no government is going to keep up with the pace of technology. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, God helps them that helps themselves. I'm afraid that's where it is. I, at the end of the day, people are going to have to rely on, you know, the kinds of things like I said. You people need to do really be on top of it and everything. And okay, most people are not going to be able to do that. I for sure. So at the end of the day, what you're actually going to have to have is some kind of trusted sources that people can turn to to give them guidance. Uh, and those have to be established outside of the government because the government is never going to be able to manage. No, no government is going to be able to manage that really. I mean, that's, that's a fairy tale. So somehow civil society, somebody in the society has to put together these kinds of organizations. I mean, it's a little bit like consumer reports, right? Consume, you know, the, there's no government organization that can do a job anywhere near what consumer reports done. Well, you need something similar along these lines. Thanks. Anthea? Um, yeah, look, I was going to pick up on something that I really like that Solette was talking about, which is the role of um, civil society and the strength of it. And I, I think if we sort of think about maybe the way in which this technology can be used by democracies, but also in more nefarious ways by other types of regimes, and I think, you know, a really obvious example is when you don't have a strong civil society that's able to push back. We can see the way in which this technology is used quite appallingly to target minorities such as the Uyghurs in China. And I think, you know, I, I really like that sort of, I think this is something that democracies are going to have to really explore and, and have that kind of safety net, which is our civil society. And we can actually see what the problems are when we don't have that. So I really quite like that point because I think it was a really important point. The other thing is I just wanted to make a comment. There was a question that came through about what we think the biggest threat of facial recognition technology is in our society. And, and I think there are many, so it's hard to sort of say um, that there's just one, but one thing that sort of um, points to me, I think it's things that both of the other panelists have touched on is how do we ever have a private moment again in our lives if we constantly have all of this technology that whether we want it to or not is going to be assessing us and making sort of value um, evaluations really about who we are and what we're doing and I think that's going to fundamentally change the way in which we are potentially and how we interact both in public and in private spaces and I think that that cause of great societal change could be one of the biggest issues I think we're facing, as well as I think, you know, when you look across the world, like I was talking about, the different approaches of different types of regimes and their responsible approach or lack thereof to the use of this type of um, technology, I think will um, deliver quite sort of different outcomes. And so, you know, you can see this sort of great things that facial recognition technology will be able to provide societies but you know there's always a flip side to that and i think that's sort of that light dark debate that we're talking about um and i'll leave there <laughs> very good very good thanks anthea um just a reminder to everyone we've got about, about another 12 minutes left so keep those uh keep those questions coming um i i i, I really like this uh, sort of thread around um different value systems in, in different um, f forms of government. And, and you, you mentioned uh, mass surveillance of the Uyghurs. Um, now, how do we, 
how do we see this this technology evolving in in terms of different worldviews and 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 different um, approaches by governments to how they view their um, permissions vis-a-vis uh, -vis individuals in their societies um, is is are, are we driving towards two solitudes here um, is there an ability in a multilateral sense to drive towards some sort of global consensus or is that just um, a, a naive um, uh, you know wish any any comment from panelists I, I don't see any global consensus happening I don't really believe that right I think that the privacy, the approach to the privacy, uh, the idea of privacy obviously varies by culture and, and, you know, not only the difference between China and Australia, but uh, in some Scandinavian countries in Europe, everybody's tax returns are open for everyone else to look at. Uh, and, and so that's a, a different approach to privacy, transparency and accountability. Um, but I think, you know, there was a good question uh, that came in about how do we deal with regulation across nations that share different values. That's not an easy, easy question to answer. Um, I think it, it definitely takes some further thinking, possibly with uh, civil society and partnership. Um, but one thing that does uh, come to mind is if you believe in the principle of privacy of the individual um, in a, a country, then supporting the development of open software, freely available, free uh, technologies that defend that privacy, that protect it, um, as well as protecting it as a standard in society. And that includes, for example, not legislating backdooring encryption uh, to communications, then, uh, then I think you, are on a, on a value plane that will help to expand that internationally. And that, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Good. Thanks you so know, pri pri privacy is an interesting thing, right? I mean, you know, privacy is a fairly recent invention. I mean, let's face it. You know, in the days when people lived in a village of 20 people, there was no privacy, had no privacy at all. Everybody knew every single move you made. So, so <laughs> you know, maybe it ends up going back to that, right? So maybe. Maybe maybe behavior in a village, you know, basically gets scaled up to you know a country of a billion people. So if I can just take take you up on that, Rand, because I might agree with you in half, but not in full on that. It's possible that in a village, um, twenty people or fifty people living together, privacy of movement may not have existed, but privacy of conversation may have existed. And the um, the rollout of the technology that we have today has fundamentally taken that away, especially when you have backdooring encryption. Um, so you used to be able to not only have a whisper with a neighbor, have a whisper in the forest, have a whisper at the, you know, at the parish pump with a neighbor. And you can't do that with confidence mm -hmm. today because your mobile phone is a microphone, because your the drones above you are a microphone. That's that's taken away. So I think it is the technology has changed that somewhat in a fundamental way compared to what it used to be. Sorry, go ahead and respond. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I agree. No, no, you're right. You're right. That that is a difference. But um, but the but there are some things which do scale really well. So if you look at, for example, the Chinese social credit system, that's a really great example, because the Chinese social credit system, in effect, what it really is is a way of crowdsourcing, crowd control. Because if, you, if the system is set up so that if you associate with somebody that the authorities don't like, that lowers your social credit score. So the result of that is you're gonna be reluctant to then associate with somebody that the authorities have, you know, is deemed as not a, you know, a, a good person. But this is exactly what happened in a village of 20 people, right? If you, if you violated the village norms, well, you were ostracized, that's it, you were out. So, so the Chinese with the social credit system, for example, has found a way to scale that behavior in a village to a billion and a half people. So that's, that's one of the other great advantages offered by the technology. <laughs> you wanna call it an advantage, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's really interesting to see how these kind of privacy related things scale and how the way they scale changes with the introduction of technology. Maybe that's why so many uh, folks left the villages for the anonymity of the cities. Uh, actually, that you know, historically, that's true. Many people did leave because of that, and they lived in and they and they lived in a big city because you know you didn't know your neighbors, you didn't know nobody knew what you were doing. Yes, 
So that's, but that's now being eroded back to the way it was in the village of 20 people. Well, certainly in the social credit system. Well, in any system. Yeah. So, so uh, a question from Avi Sulet or, uh, or, or for the panel. Um, when you talked about you know going to the going to the petrol station and, and being filmed, you know that's data. There's uh, tera, terabytes of data being collected. Um, is this data and its use uh, is it regulated uh, in Australia or Rand in, in in the United States? Or if not, does it need to be and and how? Well, I'll tell you the problem with the regulation of it is you know somebody you could you could build and I know people who are looking at this building offshore data centers underwater. So for example, ocean going uh, data centers. Well, once they're out in international waters, what are you gonna do about it? So is that well, like the um, data equivalent of money laundering? You know, <laughs> like we're offshoring this sort of data that's interesting. Well, no because, you don't, no, because you don't have to hide it. I mean, it's there, nobody can touch you. All right, I mean, money laundering, you're really trying to do something in secret, but this doesn't have to be secret. I can say, yeah, okay, sure. I got my data out there and you know, that's like that, you can't touch me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, and there are people who are, I, I mean, I know actually, I know a group who's looking at underwater data centers like that. One of the great advantages of this, by the way, is cooling problems, because when you have massive computer or, you know, setups, you have big cooling problems. So some people are building these things in the Arctic, you know, in the snow, but others say, well, gee, if you build underwater, a lot fewer problems <laughs> with heating anyway, but with, with cooling. So there are many advantages, many That's advantages. Yeah. Not only that, but you know, the way people use banks in the Cayman Islands to hide money, you can actually use data centers offshore like that to hide data. That's what I mean. That's what I'm sort of talking about. Are we sort of seeing oh, this yeah. effect in um, information and data? Yeah. Uh, you will see that. I have no doubt. I you mean, it's already have... started in some places. There are places you can hide data. And is there a sort of value um, attached to it? Is there a money-making angle to this? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> the, da the data... You know, you know the old saying, the data is the new oil? I mean, well, that's not a ridiculous idea. New frontiers rand, I think. Yep, absolutely. Yes, yes we're moving into new territory. <laughs> but, you know, like I said, but every, every new, as the attack surface expands, the opportunities expand, people are lined up, you know, 10 deep to take advantage of them. Absolutely. I mean, I think the only way to actually protect a candidate, you can try and do some data sovereignty legislation. And, and there is actually room for that. Uh, and, I, and I don't think that it's a, a, a bad thing to consider. You don't want to stifle innovation in technology. It's really important. But, um, but data sovereignty is, is also really critical. Um, that being said, I think you're better off if you're going to relate to try and regulate at the collection end. Because that is at the end where your population is, is based, walking around Australia or the U.S., um, and it's not enough to have forced consent. That is where you walk into the shopping mall and there's some, you know, sign on the door that's at 12 font size saying, you may be filmed while you're in here. Um, but, uh, but rather the collection points need to have real consent and, uh, and not forced consent. And possibly if you do that also regulation of movement from the collection point to the data centers, whether those are within the sovereign territory or externally. Um, also, I think really important is the option to opt out. So do people have the right to exit? Do people have the right to ask for their data to be delete, deleted um, and not just corrected as you might have under the privacy principles in Australia? The, those I think are pretty fundamental things. And if the data is being repurposed, it's quite a reasonable thing to ask for that data to be deleted. Well, um, fascinating conversation. Uh, I hope all of our participants have enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, it's been a real pleasure to uh, moderate this conversation um, with three experts uh, bringing uh, diverse uh, important views that you know the the, the the bottom line here is that th this technology is driving forward it's, it's changing it's changing our lives uh, individually and, and collectively it's pressuring a government so we talked about law enforcement earlier it's changing the uh, you know you know the rule set in terms of uh, criminal activity uh, you know trans transnational criminal organizations are finding ways to exploit this to their own advantage that's not good for us as a collective um, there's so much involved here. And I guess what I'm really hearing from our experts is the need um, for all of us to, um, be, to 
be more curious about what's going on to to self-inform, to self-educate, uh, to talk about this, um, to challenge legislators to get across this, and um, you know, not to let the technology um, do things to you as a passive participant and perhaps even unconsciously aware of it. So um, this is a really important issue of our times, and um, I'm glad that we um, were able this morning. Uh, to have this excellent conversation as part of the UNSW Canberra annual cyber hypothetical. So on behalf of um, all of our participants from, I can say this, around the world, um, thank you to our three panelists, Anthea, Rand, and Suolette. I wish you all uh, a very good day. <laughs>